The following presentation is brought to you by Discovery Education, leading the world of digital and video learning. Discovery Education, connect to a world of learning. Grab your compass and walking stick, because Assignment Discovery is settling a nation in American history, colonial America. First, we'll trace the footsteps of the earliest settlers who walked across a land bridge in America's Roots. Then, we'll watch European nations in a building frenzy in Colonies Take Hold. Next, we'll watch the trials and tribulations of one of the first colonies in Settlement at Jamestown. Then, we'll see how important family life was in the survival of early settlements in colonial life. Finally, we'll try to explain the strange events that occurred in a village in Massachusetts in 1692 in the Salem Witch Trials. New people in a new land, coming up next. As you watch the first half of this program, keep these questions in mind. How did Renaissance ideas influence the creation of American government? How did religion influence the formation of colonies in the Americas? The influences on American culture and government stretch far and wide. Asian nomads arrived first on our continent and Europeans immigrated later to North and South America. More recent immigrants from nearly every country in the world have arrived, bringing their beliefs and traditions. Could anything make you leave your home and travel to another country? What? Perhaps like if someone lives in the, near a desert, they might want to move. Someone lives near water. My parents once said like, if people ever had to be like drafted into the army again, then we would move. A really sudden change in government, like. Some one of our married rights got taken away. If my dad's job decided to move him overseas. Well, if there was another depression, maybe, like there was in the 1920s, or maybe if there was a plague of some sort, a lot of disease. Irish potato famine, that caused a lot of uh, immigration between the United States and America. During Earth's history, there have been many ice ages. Most scientists believe that people first came to North America during one of these ice ages about 30,000 years ago. These people were Asian nomads who hunted prehistoric animals. Following the herds, they crossed a land bridge that connected Asia to North America. As the ice age ended, the glaciers melted and the land bridge disappeared into the sea. The people gradually spread throughout North and South America when they began to farm and domesticate animals, their nomadic lifestyle came to an end. Great civilizations emerged in Central and South America with religion as the central focus. The Aztec people of Mexico and the Incas of South America built large empires that controlled great wealth. In North America, native peoples developed distinct cultures, each adapted to the local climate and living conditions. Meanwhile, unique civilizations arose in Asia, Europe, and Africa and became connected by trade. The religion of Islam spread from its home in the Arabian Peninsula, east to India, and west to North Africa and Spain. Trade networks linked Africa to Europe and the Middle East. And in China, the Silk Road helped traders carry goods across Asia to markets in the Middle East and Europe. The civilization of Europe was shaped by two religions of the Middle East, Judaism and Christianity. These religious beliefs provided moral guidance 
and helped people understand their place in the world. European civilization was also greatly shaped by the democratic traditions of ancient Greece and Rome. These political traditions and religious values would eventually form the basis of American democracy. After the fall of the Roman Empire in AD 476, Europe had no effective government. During the Middle Ages, warring nobles fought for control of land and resources. They built castles, enforced laws, collected taxes, and defended their land with hired soldiers. The Catholic Church played a central role in European life, and its leaders gained great power. Starting in the 1300s, three powerful movements swept across Europe and changed attitudes. The Renaissance witnessed a new interest in the ideas of ancient Greece and Rome. During the Reformation, which began in the early 1500s, many Europeans broke with the Catholic Church and set up new churches. And the Enlightenment period brought about an intellectual movement that valued science and reason. New ways of thinking encouraged people to question the authority of their kingdom or church. And they laid the groundwork for an age of revolution that would shape the development of the United States. Did you know? In 1996, two men found a human skeleton in the Columbia River in Kennewick, Washington. Named Kennewick Man, the skeleton is about 8,400 years old and may represent a member of one of the earliest migrants to the Americas. The early 1600s sparked the beginning of colonization in the Americas. The European nations of England, Spain, and Holland established colonies and each colony had its own unique culture, law, and way of life. How do you learn about other cultures? In many of the cities in America, there's so many different parts, all the Chinatowns, little Italy. From books, from the internet. By reading foreign newspapers. I learned about the Japanese culture when I moved there in third grade. I learned about the Mormon culture when I went to Utah. I talked with my friend, who's my best friend is Chinese. Well, I have a lot of friends who are Italian, and every time I go to dinner, at their house. I'm going to pick up a foreign exchange student from Paraguay. The um, Asian um, Culture Club and the um, African American Club, which I am part of. Like other countries in Europe, England was eager to colonize the Americas during the Age of Exploration. The English colony of Jamestown was established in 1607, but it endured much hardship in its early years. In the winter of 1609, the colonists' food supply ran out, and many people died in a period known as the Starving Time. But eventually, Jamestown recovered and found a dependable source of income, growing tobacco. The colonists established the House of Burgesses as a legislature to pass laws and levy taxes. It was the first representative government in North America. The Pilgrims, who landed at Plymouth, Massachusetts, in 1620, signed the Mayflower Compact, which declared their right to govern themselves. Another group came to Massachusetts. They were the Puritans, and they had left England in search of religious freedom. The Puritans had very strict beliefs, but they could not worship as they wished in England. They established several settlements in Massachusetts. The people of these settlements governed themselves through town meetings. The Puritans of New England earned their living in a variety of ways. Most became farmers, but some made goods and tools. The shipbuilding industry provided many jobs, and trading goods across the Atlantic became very lucrative. By the 1670s, the Puritans started to lose their power in New England. Colonists grew less interested in religion and more interested in expanding their businesses. Big changes also took place in the middle colonies. In 1664, the English captured the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam and changed its name to New York. The Quakers, another religious group from England, settled in Pennsylvania. The Quakers established Philadelphia as their capital. They encouraged other European settlers to join their colony. By the early 1700s, 
More than 20,000 people had settled in that colony. Philadelphia and New York became the largest cities in the middle colonies. They enjoyed diverse populations and economies. Life in the South was entirely different. Growing cash crops formed the basis of the colonies of Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Tobacco, rice, and sugar were perfect crops for the region's warm, humid climate. But growing these crops required a large number of workers. Landowners brought enslaved Africans to the Americas to work on their farms. When farmers wanted to plant crops on more land, they encountered trouble with the Native Americans. But fighting and diseases took a large toll, and the Native Americans were gradually forced to give up their land. While the English colonies were growing, Spain was planting colonies in what is now the United States. Spain's original colonies had been established in South America, Mexico, and the Caribbean. Then the Spanish moved into what would become the states of Florida, Texas, New Mexico, and California. Roman Catholic missionaries played a key role in Spanish colonization. Their goal had been to convert Native Americans to Catholicism. So they established missions, religious settlements run by priests, to teach Native Americans about the religion. As each European settlement formed its own distinct culture and economy, they began to develop in very different ways. Those traditions influence American culture even today. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. How did Renaissance ideas influence the creation of American government? How did religion influence the formation of colonies in the Americas? If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library. As you watch the second half of this program, keep these questions in mind. Could Jamestown have survived without John Smith's leadership? What were the advantages and disadvantages of living in a small colony? The settlement at Jamestown got off to a rocky start. But strong leadership and determination helped the settlers throughout war, drought, and famine. After surviving tough times, Jamestown would thrive as one of Europe's first American colonies. How do you face challenges and obstacles? I think of an order of goals about how to get done. I see um, what the first obtainable goal could be, a short-term goal, and then I go from there and make choices depending upon how the outcome of those goals. When I face obstacles, I like to turn to my parents or other adults that I trust that can give me good advice on things. I face obstacles and challenges with hard work and determination. I'm in the process of overcoming getting rejected to almost every college I've actively applied to. So I think laughing at it and putting on a you know strong face helps a lot. I guess you just like face it head on and try and get through it. And then if it doesn't work out, you look back on it and laugh later. In the early 1600s, England was competing with Spain to colonize the New World. While Spain concentrated on exploring the area from Mexico to the south, England looked farther north to Virginia. The English founded a new settlement, which they called Jamestown, after their king, James I. The settlers were financed by the Virginia Company, a private group of investors looking to make money from riches in the New World. The English settlers brought their culture, ideas, and tools to this unfamiliar new land. Among the settlers was 27-year-old John Smith. On May 21, 1607, Smith and some other men from the settlement set out to explore the nearby river. As the settlers explored, they also traded with different Native American groups. From these contacts, they learned of a powerful Native American leader named Powhatan, a man who would become very important to the settlers' business dealings with the Native Americans. 
Smith and Powhatan agreed on a trading partnership. Native Americans would supply the settlers with corn in return for copper, tools, and beads. In January of 1608, Smith returned to the settlement to report on his alliance with the Indians. But he learned that more than half of the settlers had died of sickness and starvation during the many months he had been gone. Smith was accused of causing the deaths of the two men who had also been on the expedition. He was tried and condemned to death. However, before he was hanged, a boat full of settlers arrived. The new arrivals shifted the balance of power in Smith's favor. They had all charges against Smith dropped. He was elected president of the colony nine months later. Within months, Smith's leadership paid off. He set strict rules, strengthened defenses, and encouraged farming. While Smith was sleeping one night, his own supply of gunpowder accidentally exploded. He was so badly wounded that he stepped down as leader and returned home to England. Smith's departure and a harsh winter sent a chill through the remaining settlers of Jamestown. Relations with Powhatan's people grew icier as well. The winter of 1609 and 1610 in Jamestown is known as the Starving Time. The settlers were reduced to eating their dogs and horses. The cats were next to go, leaving the rats. The settlers also fell victim to an even more relentless enemy, drought. The settlement had become a death camp. Fortunately for the settlers, a fleet of ships arrived from England with more men and supplies. The ships also brought a strong new leader, Lord Delaware, who was able to keep the feuding settlers in line. The drought ended, and the rainfall nurtured a cash crop of tobacco that ensured Jamestown's survival. Within a few years, Jamestown grew to a thriving settlement, its population over a thousand. On July 30, 1619, a meeting was called in Jamestown's church. Settlers formed an assembly to make laws for the colony. They called it the House of Burgesses, and it marked the beginning of representative government in the English colonies. Now, settlers could elect officials who could make laws to ensure the smooth running of the colony. Many historians see this as the birth of American democracy. Did you know Sir Thomas West, Lord Delaware, was England's first colonial governor, but he was also an explorer. He was the first one to navigate the waters and land around Delaware State, the Delaware Bay, and the Delaware River. Building a colony from the ground up was no easy task. Success depended on the colonists working together. Many colonies consisted of large families helping each other survive. Have you ever had to adapt to new surroundings? I was actually brought up in England, and in, when I was about 12, I had to move back to America. When I moved to the, um, from the Caribbean um, to America, I had to get used to this, uh, for one, the cold weather. Coming to a new high school was, um, there just being a lot more kids. I came from a Catholic school, um, born and raised, very religious, and when I came here, there were people from all different cultural backgrounds, religious backgrounds, and it was just it was big cultural shocks. People in colonial America had to work hard to make a living. Without the labor-saving machines we enjoy today, they had to meet many of their needs for food, clothing, and shelter through their own effort. All family members worked together to carry out this work. Many times, an extended family would live together in one house on one plot of land. Parents, children, aunts, uncles, cousins, and grandparents all contributed to daily chores. At home, men and women worked hard, but their responsibilities were usually different. Women took care of the house and the land immediately around it. Cooking and cleaning were time-consuming tasks, and they had to do all that work by hand. Along with handling these household chores, farm wives often helped their husbands. At busy times, like planting and harvesting, they helped in the fields. Men headed their households, and they spent most of their time working. 
They took responsibility for running the farms and did the planting, plowing, and gathering of crops. They also built their homes and hunted animals for food. Children helped at home too. Young children had tasks like gathering wood and water. Older girls helped their mothers with the household work. Older boys helped their fathers in the fields. Colonial America had three social groups or classes. Most people belonged to the middle class. They owned farms or businesses. The small upper class or gentry included wealthy farmers, government officials, and lawyers. At the bottom were indentured servants and enslaved Africans. Indentured servants received passage to America on a ship. In return, they agreed to work for a specific period of time for the person who paid for their passage. Once that period was finished, they received land, tools, and other supplies to help them start their own farms. Colonists were able to govern themselves. In 1619, the leaders of Virginia gave free white males the right to vote for representatives they called Burgesses. This was the first representative assembly in the colonies. Other colonies created similar governing bodies. But Britain also passed laws that affected the colonies. Britain would gain financially if the colonies were successful. To ensure this success, Britain passed trade laws that taxed all goods imported to or exported from the colonies. Colonists were part of a triangular trade network. Shippers carried goods from Europe to West Africa, where they were traded for slaves. They took the slaves to the Americas. The people were traded for sugar and other goods. These were carried back to Europe. Most people who bought Africans owned plantations. The Africans tended the crops grown on these large farms and did other work in the plantation house and the fields. Considered property, the Africans had no freedoms, but this did not keep them from developing their own culture. African traditions influenced language, cooking, and music. Life in the colonies could be harsh. Farmers faced bad weather, drought, disease, and the fear of the unknown. But the brave people who first settled in North America would soon create a new nation. In 1692, the small town of Salem Village became the home of one of America's oldest mysteries. Girls became sick and their illnesses were blamed on witchcraft. From that point on, fear took over and a witch hunt began. What makes you afraid? Things that makes me worried are probably not having my assignments and... Not knowing what's going to happen, not having control over certain situations. When I was four, I was scared to go to the doctor because I was scared to get shots. When I was younger and I was home alone, so it was really windy outside making noises and I was really afraid so I called my mom and I had her come home. When there's any one-on-ones or breakaways, when it's just the other person in the ball coming at me, uh, there's a slight fear I guess that I have. I guess what scares me is uh, mostly probably being alone, not having my friends to me, not have, knowing that my parents would be there for me. Being like humiliated, probably in front of like lots of people. Knowing I'm getting in trouble. That just gives me that cold feeling. <laughs> Massachusetts, 1692. 20 people are executed. Their accusers are children. The crime, witchcraft. 300 years later, it remains one of America's most murderous secrets. What caused an entire village to go mad? It's important to keep the gloves on because it's a very poisonous substance. Get inside the mind of madness. This place is creepy. Discover the secret truth behind the terror. What we have here is a 300-year-old political cover-up. The terror that was the Salem Witch Trials. In a North Carolina chemistry lab, a pharmacologist is attempting to solve a mystery buried in America's past. He's on the trail of a secret villain, one that could be responsible for a year-long reign of terror. The Salem Witch Trials. In the depth of winter in 1692, 
a few adolescent girls in Massachusetts began acting strangely. They went into convulsions, claiming to see frightening visions. Under questioning, the girls said witchcraft was to blame. Then they named those who were bewitching them. Within weeks, three suspected witches were in jail. Before the year ended, 150 people had been accused. Three died in jail and 20 people were executed. The epicenter of this spate of hysteria was a small village five miles north of Salem in a town now called Danvers. At the time, it was known as Salem Village. Only one house directly connected with the witch trials still stands. Behind me is the Rebecca Nurse Homestead, one of those houses built and lived in during the 17th century and home of one of the witchcraft victims. Rebecca Nurse, an upstanding member of the village, was accused of being a witch and hanged on July 19, 1692. The origin of the accusations lies half a mile away and is now an archaeological site. Town archivist Richard Trask has spent more than three decades examining primary source documents to chronicle the witchcraft epidemic. Sometime in probably January, very early February, uh, several children living in the Samuel Paris household at the parsonage started going into uh, convulsions or, or uh, some kind of fits. The Paris children first accused Tituba, a Caribbean family servant known to practice non-Christian religion. Tituba was a predictable target of Puritan accusation. But soon, cases of convulsions and accused witches spread throughout the county and more citizens were caught up in the madness. Even a reverend, George Burroughs, a man of God, was accused of consorting with the devil. The governor of the state of Massachusetts stood by while the sentences were carried out. Whatever judicial system was in place failed. The reasons and underlying motives for this failure have baffled historians for over 300 years. We do know one thing. The Salem witch trials were a shocking miscarriage of justice in American history. No evidence, no law, no justice. The person accusing the witch presented evidence that only he or she could see the apparitions or the specters of the witches hurting them. And suddenly the girls would start biting their own lips until they bled going, don't, don't, you're hurting me. A sure sign that a person was a witch was an apparition urging you to sign a book, the devil's book. Why was such evidence believed? If not the work of the devil, then what explanation is there for these bizarre events? Did some form of chemical poisoning trigger the mass hysteria? Or were the witch trials a simple matter of Puritan politics? Could what happened in 1692 somehow happen again in our supposedly more enlightened times? A team of experts will attempt to tell the true story of the Salem witch trials. Salem historian and archivist Richard Trask. Pharmacologist Nicholas Cozy. American historian Mary Beth Norton. And to bring the spirit of Salem back to 21st century America with a dramatic experiment in mass hypnosis, hypnotist John Pullum. To understand how 20 men and women could be convicted and executed without due process, we must first explore the climate of 17th century America. You will hold your tongue! These early settlers were religious fundamentalists. To them, the devil and his minions were a real and present threat and played a central role in their system of justice. 
spectral evidence is convincing to the court because what to us today is one of the most questionable aspects of the trials was at the time of the original trials at least possibly the most convincing part of the trial. Cornell history professor Mary Beth Norton has studied thousands of original documents from the time of the witch trials. In them, she found repeated references to something no one before her had ever noticed. What I discovered was that the New Englanders were totally consumed with fear of the Indian Wars. In 1692, the Massachusetts colonists were in the middle of a brutal war with the Wabanaki Indians. This was an epic clash of cultures, the genesis of a war that would rage for another 200 years. To the Puritans, this was tantamount to a fight with the devil. And in the early days of the Indian Wars, victory was not assured. The Puritans believed that the Indians were devil worshippers. They believed that before they arrived in America, America was the devil's territory, and so it was very easy for them to see the link between the threat from the Indians and the threat from the devil. When the girls in Salem came down with these strange afflictions, many villagers must have felt that the war with Satan had opened up a new front. The crisis began to spread when other girls in the community also began to have fits. Some of those girls were refugees from the main frontier and they began to accuse people from the frontier who they believed to be collaborators with the Indians. No story illustrates this motive better than the cruel demise of Reverend George Burroughs. He was an unconventional minister, one who had not even baptized his own children. He was the only man of the cloth to hang for witchcraft in 1692. George. Burroughs was looked upon as so atypical of what a good Puritan minister should be that the other ministers tended to want to gang up on him. Norton believes that the real reason Burroughs was killed was that he opposed the war, so he was seen as a traitor to the cause. They believed him explicitly to be in league with the devil. One of them declared that his specter had confessed to her that he had bewitched the soldiers who were fighting the Indians on the main frontier. Burroughs did not even live in Salem. He hadn't set foot there for nine years. How could young girls have known his face well enough to recognize his specter? Could war hysteria have led to a new kind of paranoia? Come on, get up. One that swept away any previous bounds of civilization? It was not as though New Englanders had not believed in witches before, because they did. It was not as though they had never prosecuted witches before, because they had. But this was another order of magnitude altogether. And it was because of the Indian War. Whatever lurked beneath the charges, the result was brutal and final. The team is on the hunt for an invisible invader one that Puritan Salem could never have imagined. There's only one fact about the Salem witch trial that everyone agrees on, and that is that the hysteria began with the convulsions in a handful of teenage girls. These physical symptoms were the means that would justify terrible ends. But what could have sent the girls into such violent fits? The village doctor was sure this had to be the work of the devil. For three centuries, scientists and historians have puzzled over the cause of the girls' symptoms and the mayhem that followed. It's almost like every new generation comes up with a theory. And the interesting thing uh, culturally is um, the theory that one generation comes up with often tells more about that generation looking at history uh, from their own perspective than it necessarily does about the past. 
In the 19th century, the leading theory was that the girls faked the symptoms and judges hanged witches so the state could grab their land. This theory, however, is not supported by the surviving documents. As a matter of fact, although if you were a accused and convicted witch, your movable estate, the things you owned within in your household could be confiscated. Your real estate, your actual land, uh, was not confiscated. Archivist Richard Trask has found proof of this for two accused witches. Both um, Giles Corey and John Proctor, while they're in prison, write wills in which they uh, give their land to their uh, children. And this is proved after they're dead and uh, the children inherit. Another theory imagines that the Salem girls, confined in their dark homes during the winter, may have become hysterical due to a chemical imbalance caused by a lack of sunlight. Tell me how many, oh my goodness. There's about 14 foot candles in here, which is not much. But there was nothing special about the homes and the climate of Salem Village. If lack of sunlight really were the cause, all of New England would have gone crazy during the winter. But there's another possibility, one that might have lurked unseen in their daily food. Ergot is a toxic fungus that infects rye. Inside it are chemicals related to LSD. This little studied toxin causes tingling in the fingers, hallucinations and convulsions, symptoms similar to those reported in Salem. The ergot alkaloids interact with neurotransmitter receptors in the brain. This can then lead to altered perceptions, altered signal processing, altered behavior. Could the girls have been bewitched by these poisonous chemicals? To find out, the team contacted its resident pharmacologist, Dr. Nicholas Cozy. Rye was a major crop in Salem, but the ergot fungus needs certain conditions to flourish. Ergot prefers wet summers followed by cold winters, and, and that uh, seems to favor the spread of ergot the following year. Those conditions were present in Salem during January and February of 1692, exactly when the girls started acting strangely. But there's a problem with the poisoned rye bread theory. How could the toxic chemicals have survived the baking process? It's known that these alkaloids are very sensitive to heat. And so one might ask the question, well, if this bread is being baked, then wouldn't the heat inactivate these alkaloids? Ergot was first suggested as a culprit 30 years ago. But to this date, no one has tested this basic question. Dr. Cozy is about to change that. If the alkaloids don't survive the baking process, then that's a fairly strong argument against the ergot theory of the Salem witch episode. Dr. Cozy will test two samples of rye bread, one with and one without the ergot fungus. Dr. Cozy has already ground raw ergot and set aside a small portion for one of our samples. He will now add the rest to half of the rye dough. Ergot is extremely toxic, so Dr. Cozy takes precautions while handling it. It's important to keep the gloves on because it's a very poisonous substance. The ergot could possibly be absorbed. I don't want to take any chances. Dr. Cozy now heats both samples to 400 degrees, the temperature at which bread in Salem would have been baked. This is our regular rye bread. And this is the rye containing the ergot. The bread should be as dry as possible to be able to extract the alkaloids. After the samples are dried, Dr. Cozy adds a solvent to extract any poisonous alkaloids that might be present. You can see that some of the vapor is starting to collect into this region. Any 
substances that we've extracted from the flower will be left behind in this small round flask. After two days, we're at the final stage of our experiment. Dr. Cozy adds a chemical to each extract that will turn blue if the suspect alkaloids are present. This is how it reacts to raw ergot. But what of the ergot that was baked in bread? It's not as dark as the pure ergotamine, but clearly there is some bluish and purplish color form demonstrating that at least some of the alkaloids have survived the baking process. To verify that the toxins are present, Cozy performs an additional test. Any suspect alkaloid will fluoresce bright purple when exposed to ultraviolet light. If the fungus has been completely destroyed, we won't see any purple under the UV lamp. Oh yeah, it does. It glows, it's still there. So this shows that the bread that was baked with the ergot in it still contains ergot alkaloids, even though the heat might have destroyed them. Clearly, some of them have still survived. The team's bread baking experiment has shown that the ergot fungus could survive high oven temperatures. But is ergot poisoning really what happened in Salem Village more than 300 years ago? Ergot constricts arteries, cutting off circulation to the extremities. This produces tingling sensations in the fingers and toes. If prolonged, it can cause gangrene. If a person eats too much ergot, the tissue eventually will start to turn dark and then blacken, and if you bump into something, your hand will fall off. While some of the girl's symptoms could easily fit the description of ergot poisoning, nothing resembling gangrene was ever seen. Unless these people were consuming ergot on a continual basis, I wouldn't have expected the symptoms to last that long. And if they were consuming ergot over that period of time, I would have expected some of these other symptoms, such as the dry gangrene, which weren't present in Salem. Trying to blame the terrifying events in Salem on a single biological factor simply doesn't work. While our investigation has shown that ergot poisoning may have inflicted some girls early on, perhaps even triggering the hysteria, ergot could not have gripped a whole town for nearly a year. The terror that filled Salem must have had another cause, one rooted not in biology, but somewhere in the recesses of the human mind. Could something that lies dormant inside us all lead to such outlandish fabrications? Are we capable of constructing our own supernatural fantasies under the right stimuli? I'm like getting a really weird sensation. I actually have tears in my eyes. The team is about to explore the hysteria by creating its own kind of controlled madness. In the winter of 1692, the Puritan community of Salem Village exploded when a handful of young girls fell prey to a mysterious malady. Soon, 20 people would be executed for the crime of witchcraft. The team has shown that poisoned dry grain could have caused the girls' convulsions and hallucinations. But how could an entire town have been gripped by their madness? How could a group of ordinary people convince themselves to set off on a vicious year-long witch hunt? Can these circumstances be duplicated in our allegedly more sophisticated times? The team decided to find out with an unusual experiment in group psychology. We're about to see whether we can make people believe in something that does not exist, something not unlike witchcraft with the help of hypnotist John Pullum. We asked seven volunteers to come to this dilapidated house in the middle of nowhere and told them that they were going to be part of a hypnosis experiment. Our director explains that hypnotist John Pullum claims he has psychic abilities and that something really bad happened in this house. Um, there actually was someone who was 
uh, found and buried in the wall. I the test is to see whether Pullum will pick up on the vibes, or so our cast thinks. The reality is that no one ever died here. This house is a movie set, and John has no psychic powers. There's a camera up there. There's a camera up there. There's a camera here. All right. John starts the experiment with his standard hypnosis routine. So I'm once again take a deep breath in. Keep your eyes closed. Let's let your breath out. And then pretends to pick up on the non-existent spirit. Just give me one second here, if you could, please. Whenever you, whenever you're ready. I'm ready. And action. Okay, give me, give me like 30 more seconds, if you could. Then we'll start. This technique is known as the power of suggestion. If John the psychic is picking up on something, will our subjects pick up on something too? This whole place is bad. I need time alone for one second. John pushes the tension by staging an argument with an earshot. There's, I know somebody's been killed here. You don't have to bull me. If this is, give me, give me a minute. Um, give me a, give me a minute. Whoa. <laughs> if you knew this stuff already. It's just, um, you know, part of the show is, is the you get enough? Their curiosity is piqued. Okay, so, um, at any point you feel uncomfortable and want to stop this, please. One by one, we ask them to go alone to the isolated spot. One that we're pretty sure is devoid of any psychic energy. Anything at all, Andy? I didn't get anything. Much. Nothing strange? No. Nothing at all? Okay. No, I didn't Follow much. me. Subject one, no response. Trevor's pendulum is moving. He feels something. Is it moving at all? It was when the dogs were barking. It was when the dogs were barking and that was it? And then, like, every time they would break, it would stop. I definitely heard trickling water from over to the left, back here someplace. It wasn't like running water, like a river. It was like a quick faucet. Like Trevor, Bronwyn also picks up on a sensation to her left. And I was sitting there, and I felt like a cold prick on my back. And I don't know, I tried to ignore it, you know, whatever, and I wasn't sure what it is. And then all of a sudden, I felt like I should just be looking that way. And I thought I heard a conversation, like two little kids talking in the bushes. What? Like, really? There's, there's like a light across the You failed the to mention this before. Yeah, for <laughs> real. Thanks. The for group real? seems to be feeding off one another. Either the spirit is getting stronger, or Bobby is succumbing to the power of suggestion. Anything at all, Bobby? No, just my ears are popping. Ears are popping? Yeah. Actually, just popping like airplane. Yeah, like I mean, like quite a few times. I'm not just like once. And it started moving and stuff back and or it was going side to side and then in circles, and then my ears started popping out there. Pop like four or five times. Yes is up and down. No is left and right. Are you a female? Are you are you female? Are you a female? Yeah, I'm like getting a really weird sensation. I actually have tears in my eyes. Okay. <laughs> John tries to nourish the seeds of belief. You want to stop or you're No, right? I'm okay. Is the spirit still in the house that hurt you? Is the spirit still in the house where we're all gathered that hurt you? Okay. Yes. Okay, let's go back. Whoa, that was weird. One more person. Grab your flashlight. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> We asked that, is that spirit still here that's in the house? And start, is the spirit that hurt you here in the house? And then started going the other way, back and forth for yes. And all of a sudden, I just got like this huge feeling that overwhelmed me. My eyes like welled up and filled up with tears. And then that's where we stopped. But it was really, yeah. Uh, I think it's pretty yeah. wild. I wish I was able to experience something like that. Our last subject is ready for a spiritual experience. Any sensations at all? Did it move at all? No. 
Didn't move at all. No sensations, nothing. Mm -mm. He actually seems to feel guilty for not having experienced anything. I didn't sense anything. Oh. Really? Nothing? I didn't move at all. Did you hear anything or feel anything? Nope. How many people, by just raising your hands, feel that there was an energy, bad or good, some spirit in this exact location here? Raise your hand. Anybody? Definitely. So three here. How many felt anything out in the second location, out in the field? Somewhere outside. All six subjects now firmly believe in the presence of a spirit, whether they felt it directly or not. There is something weird and strange about this general area. In just five hours, we've created a group of people who believe they are in the presence of a spirit. Could this be similar to the way the Salem villagers came to believe so firmly in witchcraft? How many people have ever heard of the Salem Witch Trials? Yeah. Tonight, we've kind of put you guys to the test. And I feel very sorry. I am John Pullum. I am a hypnotist. I don't see dead people. I don't channel dead spirits. This is a movie set. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Your ears were popping, I don't know why. You were feeling scratches, you were feeling cold, it was cold out there. But she had tears. And she had tears. Why was she trying? <laughs> because the spirits <laughs> I'm very I'm very happy to hear you guys laughing about it. We'll be angry. Wow. <laughs> The team has shown how easy it is to warp the minds of an isolated group of people. Isolated like the villagers in Salem were 300 years ago. But there is one question that still defies analysis. Where were the checks and balances that the English legal system should have provided? Salem was part of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts checks and balances did exist that should have given the accused a fair hearing. But we know how fair their hearing was. What happened? What we have here is Puritan gossip run amok. Tongues were wagging everywhere. Stories were being repeated. Rumors were being wildly exaggerated. Small pits of misbehavior got blown up into major aspects of witchcraft. What was strange about the Salem trials was that the governor, Sir William Phipps, did not step in and put legal proceedings to an end, as he was bound to do by English law. But one team member found a hidden secret. As Cornell professor Mary Beth Norton scoured the archives, she found some unusual statements in the governor's letters back home. Phipps wrote to England in October of 1692, claiming that he had been fighting the Indians on the main frontier all summer, and he had only recently returned, and at the time that he returned then, he had seen what was happening, and he dissolved the court and ended the trials. I was suspicious of this. Professor Norton spent months fact-checking what Phipps said in his official correspondence and discovered he was lying. I discovered that he had, in fact, been in Boston almost all summer. And furthermore, in London, I found the records that proved that he had met regularly with the judges of the court, who were also the members of his advisory council. So he had to have known everything that was going on, and he had to have been complicit in the trials. Did you know? Salem was made of two parts, Salem Village and Salem Town. Most of the people in Salem Village were farmers who wanted to be separate from Salem Town. They started their own church led by Reverend Samuel Paris. His daughter and niece were the first girls to accuse others of witchcraft. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. Could Jamestown have survived without John Smith's leadership? What were the advantages and disadvantages of living in a small colony? 
We hope you've enjoyed this assignment discovery journey into American history, colonial America. If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library.